Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Professor Newtoff, and I'll be introducing our next speaker, Vladimir. Vladimir is going to be presenting about the forest survey, so I won't talk too much about that. So with that, Vladimir. Good afternoon. My name is Vladimir Alvarado. Oh, let me take my mask off. Sorry about that. My name is Vladimir Alvarado, and during the summer, like Ms. Like Professor Nutop stated, I did a forest survey just south, like just on south of the bio uh, BE building, and uh, I, in total, I believe I uh, survey identified and tagged over I think over forty trees, like close to like forty five. Um, now you may be asking, like, what exactly a forest survey is? It's a, a way that we can identify how, you know, the forest is acting, how, the, how, you know, we should maintain it, how we should, how it's like, you know, how its health is, how, you know, what types of trees are, it's growing, what types of mass it has, uh, biomass it has, and all that kind of stuff. And as you can see, this is like an example of one of the trees that I identified. Is, uh, has a tag on it with the you know, type of species it has, the type of thing, the number of species, that, the number of species it, it is, and is a good way to, um, some, some of the ways I identified it with is an app called iNaturalist. And uh, iNaturalist is an, uh, a machine learning database that uses um, machine learning from you know, various different types of uh, species, like, you know, Bugs, plants, grasses, uh, weeds, and you know, of course, trees to you know help you identify trees that you would find outside of your house in your garden. And I use that to identify types of trees that I located in the forest. And you know, after that, I, you know, it was more broad in the way it identified trees. As a result, it had a, I had a little bit of problems like getting to pinpoint the exact type of tree it was. As a result, what I used as well as the, um, and I just was these guidebooks here, and they had a more, you know, a better way to say, how do you say, the types of leaves it has, the types of smell it gives, the types of, uh, the types of, they say, the bark, all that kind of stuff. It had more detail, more information on it. As a result, I was able to double check, even triple check, the type of tree I had and make sure I had the correct type of tree so I can correctly, you know, identify how it's, you know, characteristics, what its characteristics mean, like, you know, the size and all that kind of stuff. And, um, of course, for the location, after I identified the tree, I put, put the location in and I, into an app called Gaia. And Gaia if, is um, an app that you would use for hiking, for m m mountaineering, for all, all kinds of stuff to record your trail, to take pictures of what you have done. It records the temperature, the records, you're able to take pictures on it, put notes on it, and, you know, add, and I would use that to add basically the calculations and, you know, what type, type of tree it is, and pin the trees where they are. And of course, uh, one of the good things about Gaia is it's, um, how do you say, it's more, Google Maps doesn't really give, you know, lat longitude to latitude to like five feet or like, you know, a meter. If, if, if you will, it would give it to like, I think 20 feet. I don't know how much that is in meters, sorry. Um, so as a result, it's better to use um, Gaia when you're trying to have, trying to find what, what trees that there are in a, like a certain space of like five feet or like 10 feet, because you know, you can't really do that with Google Maps and such. Um, to, you know, the different types of characteristics I, I used to identify the trees that I put on Gaia were, one was a diameter, and the other was pictures and all that kind of stuff. And the diameter, of course, I used a, a tape measure at breast height. I measured how much it is, and I divided it by pi to get the you know, diameter of the tree. So first I got circumference, then I got the divided by pi to get the diameter of the tree. And I put all that information into a data inventory, together with its species name, its common name, its different types of, you know, um, its diameter, and uh, if I could, I would have put in the height as well, and you know, all and it, the tag number to tell you what tag it is, so you can go find it in the forest and like you know understand like what tree it is, see it 
there. And in the future, the good thing about this is that students would be able to put in the different, like add to it to it. For example, in like one or two years, the tree may grow. And as a result, it, you, you can see the difference in like the sizes using the, the, what I have here and like in, in the tree in two years. Um, this of course is the map I have. You, as you can see, the different colors, like red maple is for the red maple, pigna hickory is for the, the pink ones are pigna hickory. And you may notice, you know, to go with the map and different colors of it, you know, I have like, you know, the, uh, the sassafras is just a single sassafras, you know, something like that. And the, all those sassafras are something like, you know, they're like bushes and stuff like that. This one was actually like a, a it looked like a tree. It was very tall. It was like, you know, it had leaves on top. And, you know, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> and of course, you may notice how these, a lot of these trees are like jumbled up together, like groups and stuff. And that, you know, I tried to like, find a reason why that is. For example, the American beech is one species. All three American beeches I found were all together in one group. And the reason why I found that interesting was because of the tree spacing in trees like, you know, pig nuts and mock nut hickories, where they're both hickory trees. And I did some, a little bit of research that I, you know, and I found that, that an ecologist called Suzanne Simard Said that you know trees are social creatures. They have networks uh, underneath their roots, and like with together with fungi and all that, and like you know, and they would share resources together and share structures, their structure, and be able to like you know, share information how the forest is, and you know, be able to better grow younger trees. And the reason why I mentioned the pig nut hickories and mock nut hickories to this is because compared to the pig nut hickory, the mock nut hickory is very very young. It's, it's uh, in general, what I found was that its diameter was 9.4 centimeters. And most of the time, these trees are very slow to grow as well. So they're like growing at two feet or like in two feet a year. And a lot of these trees are like 15 feet tall or maybe even 10 feet tall. So these are like, you know, eight years or even like, you know, five, eight years old and very young trees. And compared to the pigna hickories, which are like, you know, a good 22, like, you know, centimeters in, dia in diameter. And they're like, you know, 60 feet tall. And they're, you know, they've probably been here since before the campus was even built. And so it should, it should give, give you an idea of how the, you know, environment was before maybe even the campus was built and also the hospital. And what's interesting about that is because they're so young, you can, you know, kind of tell that in, in like, in like the, pre the previous map that these trees, all of them, all these pig nut hickories, and, and they're all near, you know, near, uh, uh, other trees, and not not pigment, but not the mocker nut hickories are near the uh, the, the 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 other trees because they're fairly young and trying to get you know, you know nutrients from the other trees is what I believe they are doing. And I, may, I may need more research to prove that. And of course, we have the entirety of all of our trees. And before, I showed that you know these like this chestnut oak was the biggest. The, we had the largest amount of, of, of chestnut oaks, but the chestnut oaks are also the largest in diameter, they're the biggest tree. And they're, you know, very large trees, like, you know, basically the ones that are like, you know, holding the structure of the forest. A lot of these trees are like, these trees are very large. They also have a lot of other plants around it, growing around it. And what's interesting about these trees is that they're co-dominant. And these, that, that means they're sharing the same stem and they could be very fragile in like rain or storms and as a result would fall down and you know, probably cause some damage due, due to it. And that goes into why I believe it's, go, it's very important, not, not basically important to create a forest survey and forest inventory because we're able to tell how the forest may play a part on campus and it may you know, be able to damage some parts of like, you know, the campus or maybe we'll be able to tell what trees can fail and if they do fail, be able to observe certain effects of its failure and certain effects of like, you know, the surrounding trees and plants and how they react to it. Um, that's, there's also a lot of other stuff like, you know, the different types of plant life, the diversity of the forest that we can look into. If we do a forest inventory, I found eight species, but there are, are probably 11 that I, I, I didn't put in, the Norway maple, the white oak, or the yellow poplar that I found, because it was like only one and it was like, very like, I think the last few days of the project that I found them and I couldn't really put them into the presentation that I had right here. Um, apart from that, there's also different types of, you know, 
animals that may be living in the forest that we may be able to research and identify. And also the, the types, of, it would be good to just identify all that kind of stuff and be able to know what's in the forest to be able to protect it or, or just research it. Thank you for listening. Thank you.